Welcome back. Tom Harbin here with you. And on the line with us, Dar Jamail, staff writer with Truthout, author of several published books uh, on the war in Iraq, the forthcoming The End of Ice. You can read his work at truthout.org. Uh, his uh, uh, Twitter handle is Dar Jamail, D A H R J A M A I L. And Dar, do you have a, is there a Dar Jamail website? Uh, yes, Tom, thanks. It's simply darjamail.net. That's That was my recollection. Great. Thank you. Um, you have a, uh, uh, a new book out about uh, the end of ICE, uh, the title of Peter Wadhams uh, used as well. Um, uh, I'm guessing this is about climate change? Uh, it, it is. It's about abrupt climate change. Actually, it's forthcoming. It will come out. Uh, it will be published by the New Press uh, probably in the middle of 2018. And it is uh -huh. called The end, end of Ice, whereas Peter's book is called Farewell to Ice. Oh, you're right. You're right. It is Farewell to Ice. You're absolutely right. Thank you for that. Um, so tell us about the Great Barrier Reef. You've been writing about this for Truth Out. I have. I was just there a couple of months ago. I went out on the reef snorkeling it with experts uh, for as part of the research for my book. And uh, even then, in the middle of February, it was already well into the second mass coral bleaching event in as many years. If we remember, the coral bleaching event last year killed 22% of the reef, and already this year, now two-thirds of the total reef, that's two-thirds of a 1,400-mile-long coral reef ecosystem is now, as we speak, undergoing a major bleaching event. So the, the reef is in very, very big trouble. I mean, to cut to the chase, I, I think as well as several of the experts I've been talking to is that we're basically witnessing the end of the Great Barrier Reef. And not just the Great Barrier Reef. I mean, this is happening all over the world. A couple of weeks ago, we took our my, my wife, Louise, and I, and, and uh, two of our three kids, and my brother and a couple of his kids, we took our uh, every other year one-week family vacation in Roatan, which is this island off the coast of Honduras that is famous for its diving because it's got all these coral reefs. And uh, we went out over the reefs, and they're all bleached out. I mean, not all of them, but you look at the pictures in the dive shops from 10, 15 years ago, and they're just exploding with color and life. And now, uh, you know, occasionally you'd see a bright piece of coral, but most of it was just grayed out. And, you know, th this is just a relatively obscure part of Central America. Um, I, I, I'm guessing this is happening all over the planet. That's a fact, Tom, unfortunately. And what you saw perfectly describes everything that I saw at the Great Barrier Reef, as well as in Guam and in Palau and other places I've been going to research my book. And, and this is a uh, very, very accurate description uh, of, of how we're actually very far ahead of even uh, what some people have thought have been more extreme scientific reports. Like, for example, in 2011, NOAA released a report that said without dramatic intervention, we could lose 100 percent of all coral reefs by 2050. Yet when I talk with the experts I'm talking with for my book, they several of them think that that, that report was far too conservative. Uh, another example is uh, within the last year, we had another scientific study came out that said by by 2050, 98% of all coral reefs around the planet would be experiencing coral bleaching every year. And again, many of the experts I'm talking with said, no, 2017 is the new 2050 because that's what we're seeing right now. Yeah, and this is a double whammy, too, because not only are coral reefs, you know, sources of, of, uh, of life, uh, they're alive themselves, but they're also, you know, a, a habitat for life, um, which becomes less effective when they die. But also, they are major carbon sinks. They pull carbon uh, out of the water, dissolve carbon out of the water, and use it to form the bodies. I mean, that's what the reef is made out of. And when they go from extracting carbon to dying and s slowly dissolving that carbon back into the ocean, um, this is a major problem. Are you, are you, um, are you looking at the possible role of, of methane in rapid climate change? I have been writing about methane for quite a few years, just like you have, Tom, because we understand how critically important it is. I mean, this is a greenhouse gas that over a 20-year time scale is roughly 100 times more potent greenhouse gas than even is CO2 in the atmosphere. And we're already seeing large amounts of methane being released across the Arctic as the permafrost melts specifically on land, but then also as now the Arctic Ocean is warming. Uh, we had another report that came out within the last couple of months that showed already one quarter of the entire area of the Arctic Ocean is now the chemical equivalent of the Atlantic Ocean. So it's already changing. It's warming up. 
uh, and that's, of course, then posing a great risk of warming up and melting even more of the methane hydrates under the Arctic sea ice in the shallow seafloor of, of the north slope of the Arctic, and that's what's releasing more and more of this methane. And this is a huge issue, and as Natalia Shikova, um, a methane expert out, out of the University of Alaska Fairbanks, has reported now for years, at any moment, literally, we could experience what she calls a methane burp, where uh, the melting basically reaches a point where a massive amount of methane can be released in, in the form of uh, literally one giant 50 gigaton amount of methane being released into the atmosphere, which would obviously dramatically and abruptly escalate all the, the abrupt climate disruption that we're already experiencing. Yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a very dangerous thing. And we're uh, I'm working on a documentary on this. In fact, I'll be in Svalbard, Norway uh, next month uh, for some filming on it. We just came back from Costa Rica where we were filming uh, uh, recarbonization in the soil. So there's there's a, a, a I'm, I'm so glad you're you're still working on that so, that you're that you are working on that because we need a lot of voices and a lot of work on this. Dar, if, if we just have a couple minutes left, and I and you have done such great work and and been on this program many times over the years on your work in Iraq, on your, 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 your reporting from Iraq. Um, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on the current state of affairs with regard to both Iraq and Afghanistan. It seems to me that this administration is completely rudderless, that, they, that Trump ran on non-interventionism. He doesn't know how to get to extract us from there. Um, and so, and he has no essential governing principle, uh, you know, unlike at least the people who got us into the mess, you know, George W. Bush, their theory was, well, you know, it was this libertarian idea. If we just completely tear down the government, the free market will come in and fill the vacuum. It was, you know, L. Paul Bremer and, and, and Rumsfeld's thing. Um, what's the current state of affairs? And, 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 and do you think that I've char accurately characterized the past state of affairs? I think you have accurately characterized it. And really, another really disconcerting situation is it's bombs away for this administration in both of those countries. And looking at Iraq specifically, you look at this hellish situation where ISIS still controls large areas of the country. Uh, Syria is completely out of control because of it. Uh, the, the whole region is inflamed. And this all started with shock and awe, the, the, you know, the, basically right. the lead into the invasion. And so and throughout the occupation, drop more bombs when there's a problem. And guess what? That creates more instability and more terrorism. And look at the region now compared to pre-2003. Look at Afghanistan now compared to uh, um, back during U.S. intervention, of course, funding and supporting the Mujahideen against the Soviet occupation. So both of them have these big parallels, which is when you add bombs to the mix, it just creates more terrorism and makes the situation spiral completely out of control. And that's exactly what we have today. And this, this administration is simply just doing more of the same except faster. What's your prognosis? Well, how, how do you think this is going to play out? Oh, gosh. I mean, well, you've been there. You've been on the ground. You, you know the situation. Yeah, the one thing that I could say for sure is it's only going to get worse. I mean, there's no way that bringing in more bombs to a situation and increasing troop levels uh, in Iraq and in Syria now is going to make it better. I mean, I think we have enough data running the experiment. And if we keep running that experiment, but then add more bombs and more troops, it's pretty predictable. It's only going to get worse. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is tough stuff. I, I, I have observed over the years that um, People get locked into these kind of cult things. Um, the, the Nazis were a cult. Uh, the, the Tojo uh, uh, thing was, you know, the, this emperor worship was a cult um, uh, in Japan. And, and those cults really drove Japan and Germany. And it wasn't until we revealed that the cults were a sham that the people of Japan and Germany abandoned their, their, their loyalty, their fealty to uh, those cults, to the cult of Nazism and of, uh, and of emperor worship. And um, it, it almost seems like the, the major cult driving much of the violence in the Middle East is Wahhabism, is the, you know, which is being exported by our ally Saudi Arabia. And I, you know, looking at it through that lens, uh, first of all, I'd love your take on that. Um, uh, I don't see any way to disrupt what's going on there if we can't change Saudi Arabia's behavior. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, look at the, all the problems in the Middle East, and 
you know, the, the two countries uh, that are at least geographically located there that are at the root of the problems are, you know, the Wahhabism with Saudi that you mentioned, which is also supported by a lot of the Gulf countries like Qatar and, and others like this. And on the other side, we have the state violence of Israel against Palestinians and other places around the country, you know, their periodic violence against Lebanon or parts of, of the Golan Heights in Syria. And of course, the single biggest supporter of both of those countries is the United States. So what do we do? Well, for starters, the most obvious thing to do uh, on paper is immediately cease all that support and uh, start pushing the U.N. to hold those countries responsible for the war crimes that they're directly involved in, Saudi and Yemen and other places around the Middle East and Israel for the other areas that I mentioned as well. And then, of course, <laughs> volunteering up the own you know, U.S. government for uh, the war crimes that this administration is already uh, directly uh, involved in, as well as those of uh, the successive uh uh, presidential administrations yeah. before this one. When so, when when I mean, Trump threw those tomahawk missiles into Syria, that was uh, my understanding is that was the first time that we actually directly attacked the Syrian government. Up until that point, we had been playing the the enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing with Syria. In other words, we had been going after ISIS. Uh, Bashar, uh, Bashar al-Assad had been going after ISIS. Now we're going after Assad. Isn't shouldn't that require a declaration of war? Well, exactly, Tom. But, you know, this country, just like with Iraq, uh, doesn't like to declare war because then that opens it up for the things that I just discussed happening. That, that, right. You know, that's what accountability and things like this can be. Exactly. Yeah. So so we've got this mess. Uh, it's remarkable. Dar Jamal, a staff writer with Truth Out, author of several published books on the war in Iraq and the forthcoming The End of ICE. Is that uh, available for pre-order anywhere, Dar? Uh, not yet, Tom. But okay. Thank you. Okay, truthout.org is the website. You can tweet him at Darjamail, D-A-H-R-J-A-M-A-I-L, uh, or at truthout. Dar, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Tom. It's always great talking to you. We'll be right back.